<laughs> there you are. Come on in. Have a seat. Have a chat with Granny. Hello and welcome. It's so good to see all of you here today. Remember in the last video, I was making a scarf for my friend Mama Atheist. Well, I finished that and now I'm working on one for my friend Kitty the Atheist. Last time, I said I would tell you in another video about what people told me was true, but I realized was not true. I'm back now to tell you about that time in my life. If you missed the prior videos on Atheism for Children, there are links to them in the description, or click on the children's videos playlist. The story of wrong things that I was told as a believer begins when I was an older teen. I went to a couple different churches with different friends. One took me to a church where they pray in tongues. The pastor said, if you don't speak in tongues, you aren't really saved because this is a gift that God gives to everyone. But a few of the people are given the gift of interpretation where they understand the message and can tell you what it is that the people in tongues are saying. Everyone in that church would pray out loud and it sounded something like this. Now in the name of Jesus, let every worship the Lord, worship the Lord, for the Lord demands a worship right now. The Lord demands a worship right now, for your worship will rise above it. Your worship will rise above it. Hamanda aka ata raka te de baka sanda ata ambo osa kata rite eke ba. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement, angelic reinforcement, angelic reinforcement. Vika hata anda ata ora bata rata anda ek ek manda rasata. It's just gibberish. Some people call it tongues, but I don't think it is. I think it's just making any sound and sometimes the same sounds over and over. I knew when I prayed like this that I was just pretending to speak in tongues because that was what we were supposed to do. But everyone there said it was the Spirit of God giving you prayer words. I didn't go to that church very long because I didn't think that what they were doing was real, even though the people who were there really did believe in what they were doing and that what they were doing was from God. But I didn't. There isn't much point in worshiping God if you're just pretending. The Bible says to worship in spirit and in truth, and I fully believed that this was possible. So I looked for another church where I could do this, and I found one. Then I moved away to college, and I found another church there. And then I got married. My husband was in the army, so we moved a lot. And each time, I found a new church. Some churches were better than others. One thing they all had in common was that they all talked about God and how he would save you from your sins. But different churches had different ideas about who would be saved, how long they would be saved for, and how they were to be saved. For example, some churches say that anyone who asks God to be saved is saved. Others say that God must call you and you must be chosen by God to be saved. Some say that once you are saved, you are always saved. Others say that if you are saved and then you sin, you lose your salvation and you just pray to get it back. The fact that all of the churches say that the Holy Spirit is guiding them into truth in seeing salvation this way in the Bible was the first thing that made me start questioning God. How can the same Holy Spirit guide one believer to think that salvation is forever and another to think that salvation is temporary and yet it's the same spirit that's guiding both into one truth, using the same Bible. But I only thought about this a little bit. Mostly I thought that this was something that I would have to ask God about after I die. In other words, I thought I needed to accept on faith that both were real believers, and once we got to heaven, we would know the full truth on who was right and who was wrong. 
figured it would actually turn out to be somewhere in between the two claims. But exactly where or how, I had no idea. The big question for me, the one that moved me away from Christianity was, what about people who don't believe? Does the Christian God want people who don't believe in him to believe? The Bible says yes, but isn't God supposed to know everything? Doesn't God know exactly what each person needs to hear in order to believe? Again, the Bible says yes. So if God wants everyone to believe and knows what everyone needs to hear or see or whatever to be able to believe, why not just give every person what they need? Some Christians would answer, well, God won't do that because people have free will to choose to believe. Okay, but what about the Apostle Paul? Reflecting on the conversion of the Apostle Paul is what turned me away from mainstream Christianity. I still believed in God. I still believed in the Bible. But I now believe that there had to be more to the story. Because without more, the God of the Bible became incoherent. He didn't make sense. God cannot be all-knowing, able to do all things, and desiring all people to know him, but not telling all people about himself. These can't all be true. Not unless there's another piece to the story that we don't know about that allows for all of them to be true. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Paul didn't believe. He was a Jewish Pharisee that saw Christianity as a perversion or distortion of the Jewish faith. As such, he sought to stamp out this fledgling faith by persecuting people who follow this new teaching. When Stephen, an early Christian, was stoned to death by the Sanhedrin for preaching about Jesus, Paul was there and held their coats. But God wanted Paul as a servant. So Jesus personally came to Paul and told him all about himself. Or at least Paul saw a vision of him. The people that were with Paul didn't actually see anyone. So it wasn't like Jesus came back for Paul. If God can do that for Paul, why not for everyone else? This is the question that turned me from Christianity to developing my own theology about a God who loves everyone and saves everyone. If God can tell Paul about himself so Paul will believe without violating Paul's free will, God can do that or whatever anyone else needs to see or hear so that they will believe. Why don't we see God doing this every day? Either God doesn't want everyone to believe, and the Bible is wrong on that point, or God wants everyone to believe, but he isn't willing to tell people what they need to know in order to believe. If God isn't willing to reveal himself, can you really say that he wants people to believe? No matter how you look at it, the Bible is either wrong about God wanting to save everyone, or else it is wrong about God being able to save everyone. The only way to reconcile these two claims about God, that God is willing and able to save everyone, is to find another part of the story, a part that isn't in the Bible. It is possible that the Bible is true, but isn't the whole story. So I developed my own theology, that everyone would be saved, but some would be saved after they die. That after death, when everyone appears before God for judgment, everyone will be given a choice to choose eternity with God or choose eternity apart from God. This way, God fully reveals himself and gives everyone an informed choice about him. Not the Bible view that people are supposed to choose and follow God while not fully understanding who he is, what he's about, and what he wants. After all, an informed decision is an intelligent decision. A decision for God without an understanding of who God is, while a decision of faith, isn't a decision of intellect. And didn't God give us our minds with the intent that we use them? While believers would tell us that faith is necessary, without it it is impossible to please God, it is also not supposed to be a blind faith. We're supposed to trust a God that we know something about. So now I found myself in a church, believing the same God as the people around me, 
and believing in the same Bible as the people around me, but believing different things about God than they did. I had always been very active in the church. I was much less so now. I was having doubts about God and the Bible, as it seemed we didn't have the whole story. I prayed about it. I asked the pastor. But I found no answers to my doubts and questions. No God came to me, or sent me a dream, or spoke to me, assuring me that my faith was in the right place. No one suggested any books or people that had answers for me, nor did I find any with my own searches. The beginning of the end of my faith came when my youngest child, 18 at the time, told me that it was impossible for all of the animals on Noah's Ark to survive. The methane gas from all the farts and poop would have killed them. The ark is only supposed to have one window. A single window wouldn't allow for sufficient circulation of air for the animals to survive. Of course, being the adult, I told my son that this was silly. But then, wondering why he thought this, after he left the room, of course, I looked it up on the internet. And you know what? He was right! I found several articles saying that if you just put pigs in a barn without sufficient air circulation, the pigs will die. And when you think of all the animals on the ark, they would have died. Now, Ken Ham in Answers in Genesis likes to say that the ark looked like this. And the one window ran the whole length of the boat. But even with this, the air still can't circulate to the lower decks. But it was another alleged fact about the ark that would sink the boat that was my faith. The problem for me was my faith was built completely on the Bible. I wholeheartedly believed that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. That means that the Bible is absolutely true. Everything in it was inspired by God and is the word of God. The problem with building all that you believe on the inerrancy of the Bible is the Bible only needs to be wrong on one point to show that the Bible isn't inerrant. The Bible isn't absolutely the true word of God. Faith like this is like a house of cards. If you remove just one, the entire house tumbles down. If you prove the Bible to be wrong on just one point, then it can't be the inerrant word of God. The Bible is fallible, and then so is God. The one point came from me in Noah's Ark. Many people have proven not only do we know that the story of Noah's Ark could not happen, but we know that it did not happen. Why not? There are many answers to this question. The most complicated one, at least for me, is the one from geology. If you want to know more about how geology disproves Noah's flood, look at the description of this video and you'll find links to some articles. For me, the easiest answer was from history. The flood is supposed to have happened in about 2350 BC. History tells us that at that time there were civilizations in South America, India, China, Europe, and Australia, as well as the Middle East, that we know of. These are civilizations we have artifacts for, and we can trace their histories. There could be others that we haven't found yet, yet despite there being known civilizations on almost every continent at the time of the alleged flood, there is no evidence that any of these were utterly destroyed and rebuilt from scratch a few hundred years later. The flood is supposed to have taken a year. After the flood, the Bible says the people didn't spread out to repopulate the earth, and that's why the Tower of Babel happened so that people would go to other places and start people groups all over the earth. The Tower of Babel was supposed to have happened about a hundred years after the flood, yet there is no evidence of any of the ancient civilizations vanishing at the time of the flood and then restarting a hundred or so years later. Instead, there is archaeological evidence that these civilizations continued to live as always. None of them even noticed this worldwide flood. A Christian apologist, an apologist is someone who studies the Bible and makes arguments defending Christianity, named Josh McDowell, wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. 
I read it as a college student and listened to Josh McDowell say that no archaeological evidence has ever been found that disproved anything in the Bible. I believed this for decades, but he is wrong. There is archaeological evidence of whole civilizations that prove that there never was a worldwide flood. If you are thinking, why would that destroy your faith in God and not just your faith in the Bible? Because everything I knew about God was from the Bible. Without the Bible, who is God? What about personal experience? Didn't you ever see prayer answered? Didn't you ever hear a voice of God in your head as you prayed? Yes, I did. And when I was a Christian, I thought that was God talking to me. But when I stopped believing in God and I reflected back on these times, there was never anything miraculous about any of it. Yes, I sometimes prayed for things and they happened, but they were things that could just as easily have happened whether I prayed or not like someone getting a job or recovering from an illness. There is no way to know if a God had anything to do with any of it. Now, if a friend had needed a job and a stranger called them out of the blue, offering them a job that they had never applied for, that might be evidence of an answer to prayer. But I never saw anything like that happen. If you apply for a job, pray for it, and get the job, there is no way to see the hand of God in that. The same thing happens if you don't pray. You can't prove that no God helped, but when God working and God not working appear the same, there's no reason to believe in a God. What about hearing the voice of God in your head when you pray? If you have experienced that, has that voice ever told you anything that you didn't already know? It might say something that you've forgotten, or maybe something that you knew but hadn't been thinking about, but it's never some new information that you had never heard. So how do you know it's the voice of God and not just your own thoughts that you are hearing? You don't, or at least I didn't. Since I stopped believing, I have met believers and even listened to Christian apologists that say the Bible is not inerrant and they don't believe there was a global flood. Some say the Bible exaggerated and the flood was just a big local flood. Some believe some parts of the Bible and not others. So it is possible to believe in God, but not the inerrancy of the Bible. So did I have a good reason to stop believing in God? Maybe, maybe not. That's up to you. Each person needs to decide for themselves what they believe and why. I think the better question is why believe? I shouldn't need a reason to not believe something. I need a reason to believe something. Because being an atheist is as normal as being a believer. Judy puts it another way. Let's listen to Junie's story. My friends believe in God. My grandmas believe in God. My Grandpa believes in God. My aunts, uncles, and cousins even believe in God. So, do I have to believe in God? They believe in a place called heaven after you die. But I know my grandpa is somewhere in a box where there's a lot of other dead people. So is that heaven? My parents don't usually talk about God. I don't know who this God person is. At Christmas time, I kept hearing about this baby Jesus. Who's baby Jesus? I only know about Santa, but Santa is my dad. So is Jesus my dad too? My cousin once told me, how do I not know about God? They say, only bad people and people who are weird don't know who God is or don't believe in Him. Am I weird? I'm not bad. Am I? There's no bad place. Just my room. And when I need somebody, I have mom or dad. My dad says 
we just have to be nice to people if we want to be friends. Or ask questions when something doesn't make sense. And to make sure that whatever I do makes me happy. But it's okay to be sad, too. And it's okay to be mad. I'm not sure what I have to believe in. I just know I want to be friends. I love to draw. I love to play on my Switch. And I especially love playing with my doggy. So what do you like? I am me. So who are you? Because this is a children's video, there can be no comments. But if you would like to ask me or Junie a question or talk about what you believe and why you believe it, send me a message on Twitter or email me. My email address is in the About section on the channel. Live your life.